About 125 years ago, someone asked a very interesting question. What would happen if someone started walking randomly? So sometimes in one direction, then back, sometimes up, sometimes down, and sometimes sideways. Now, this might not seem like a very interesting question in terms of applications, but actually today it is quite fundamental. You can see that an atom walks randomly. It's sometimes hit by an atom that's going this way, sometimes by an atom that's going that way, and so an atom in a gas performs a random walk. Similarly, the stock market may be acting randomly, or if you take, let's say, long molecules in a polymer chain, well, they could be oriented randomly too. So then what would be the length of the polymer, etc. Now, it turns out that this is a very interesting problem because in one dimension and in two dimensions, there is a certain property, but when you go to a higher dimension, when you go to three dimension, that property doesn't hold anymore. So let's begin with the simplest form of random walk in one dimension. To begin, we shall take the random walk in one dimension. Imagine that there's a drunkard who's had a bit too much to drink, and he takes a step to the right with probability p, or he could take a step to the left with probability q. Obviously, p plus q is equal to 1. Each time he takes a step, he doesn't know whether his next step will be towards the right or towards the left. Let's say that he starts off from home, call it the point zero. We shall assume that he always moves by an equal amount to the right, that is to say, one unit to the right or one unit to the left. As he starts out, he takes a step to the right, a second step to the right, then a step to the left, another step to the right, then to the left, left again, right, left, left, left. After taking 10 steps, he is two units to the left of where he started from. We can also represent this in the form of a graph. If we take this axis over here as the positive distance traveled, then he moves a maximum of two units to the right and eventually ends up two units to the left. Now, this is just one particular path. He could have, of course, started from here, moved to the left and then left again, and he could have kept moving 10 steps to the left or he could have moved 10 steps to the right this over here is a particular path of 10 steps. We will now calculate the probability of a path with n steps, of which k are to the right, and therefore n minus k are to the left. p into p into p k times is the probability of taking k steps to the right. Now, obviously, he's taken n minus k steps to the left, and the probability of that is q into q into q, n minus k times. And so this over here is the probability of taking k steps to the right, n minus k to the left. But now let us ask, how many different ways are there of taking k steps to the right, n minus k to the left? Well, that's the answer. Why? because there are a total of n factorial ways of taking n steps. All the k steps to the right are identical, and so we divide by k factorial, and all steps to the left are identical, so we divide by the number of steps to the left factorial. Of course, this is nothing other than the binomial distribution, which you have seen before, and this p of k becomes this probability. Now let's ask, what is the net distance which is traveled? So when you travel 
k steps to the right, you travel k units of distance. But then there are n minus k units of distance travel to the left. And so you must subtract that. And so there's a minus sign here. This gives you 2k minus n. Now, because we have the probability distribution, p of k, we can calculate the average of k from the earlier module. 1.4, which was on the binomial distribution, we found that the average value of k is just n times the probability p. How did we get this? Well, one way is you just multiply p of k by k itself, and then you sum over all values of k from 0 up till n, work out this sum, and that becomes n times p. Now, similarly, we can calculate the average value of k squared by taking k squared, weighting it by p of k, summing over k, and that gives n into n minus 1 p squared plus n p. So since we have the average value of k, we can calculate the average value of the distance traveled, which will be from here 2k minus n. So the average value d will be 2 times the average value of k minus the average value of n, which is n itself, that gives n into p minus q. Now note over here that if p is equal to half and q is equal to half, then these cancel exactly. And so on the average, this man will travel equally to the right as to the left, but if p is bigger than q, that means there's a greater chance that he'll be to the right, and so the average value of d will be positive. Let's take the average value of the square of the distance d. Now, d can be both negative or positive, but d squared is always positive. Now, from here, d squared will be 4k squared minus 4nk plus n squared. So if we take the average value of d squared, we get 4 times the average value of k squared minus 4 times the average value of k times n plus n squared. And that is n squared into p minus q squared plus 4npq. Now if we take the simplest case, which is p is equal to q equal to half, then the average value of d will be equal to 0. These two cancel. And in the average value of d squared, which we see over here, this term goes to 0. But this term over here is 4n into half into half, which is n. And so the average distance which is traveled during n steps will increase as the square root of n. Now, this is a result that's particularly important if you have an atom in a gas that can move this way with equal probability as moving this way. Let us now look at the random walk problem a little more carefully and formally. So we will define x1, x2 to be independent, identically distributed random variables. So this is just as in the case of the law of large numbers, where we also had independent, identically distributed random variables, we will suppose that each of these random variables, xi, takes the value plus 1 or minus 1 with equal probability half. Of course, I could have made this p and this q, but Let's work out the case half because there's already so much to be learned in this simple case and I don't want to complicate things. Let's now define the sum of all these x's. So Sn is the sum of all these random variables up to Xn. That, of course, is the distance from the starting point after n steps. Now we can raise a lot of interesting and important questions. The first question being, after how many steps will the drunk return home? There are several things to be said for this. First, 
That number has to be even. He could be two units to the right or two units to the left, or he could be back home. But after three steps, he definitely cannot be at home. He's either to the right or to the left. So this number has to be even. Therefore, we are going to call it 2 times m. In other words, the sum for an odd number of steps can never vanish. Next, we can ask how many paths begin and end at the starting point at home. Let's see how to work this out. So, look at this quantity, the binomial 2m choose m. And as you know, this is just 2m factorial divided by m factorial into m factorial. Why is that? Well, because 2m is the total number of objects, identical objects, and the number of ways of choosing them is 2m factorial, but m of these are identical, and the other m are also identical, and so therefore you have 2m factorial divided by m factorial into m factorial. Now, each of these parts has exactly the same probability, and that probability is half to the m, half to the m, and that's 1 over 2 to the power 2m. We conclude that the probability of return after 2m steps is the total number of paths that begin and end at the starting point divided by the total number of paths, which is 2 to the power 2m. Now, remember that m in this case has to be greater than or equal to 1. If we take m equal to 0, that means if we have not stepped outside, then by definition we will say that p0 is equal to 1 itself. That actually is quite consistent with this formula because if you have 0 factorial over 0 factorial squared, that's 1 over 1, and then there's 1 over 2 to the power 0, which is also 1. And so this p0 equals 1 also makes sense from the point of view of this formula over here. Let's return to the graph that you saw earlier with n equal to 10 steps. Here, we saw that after 6 steps, the man first returned home. So this we will call the time of first return, but then there's a second return. And if there were more steps, then there would be a third return, a fourth return, etc., etc. Of particular interest to us will be the question, when will he first return home? We're going to study this question in some detail. Let the first return be at time 2k, that is to say after 2k steps. There will be a certain probability of returning after 2k steps, and I'm going to call that q2k. Now, of course, for the concept of first return to make sense, k has to be at least 1. But what is the probability of a first return without taking any steps? Well, we're going to call that q0 and define it to be 0. How does one calculate the probability of first return? Well, obviously, that's the number of parts that don't return home. That is to say, those which are totally above, like here, or lie totally below, such as, well, there's only one path over here, and that's just this here. No path is allowed to cross the x-axis. So as you can see from the example that we chose, this path lies entirely above the x-axis. Of course, there are other paths that lie below the x-axis, so one could be this, and there was no crossing between here and here. Actually, as we shall see very soon, this probability of first return can be calculated knowing this. But to arrive at this conclusion, we shall need a very important theorem 
that theorem says that P2M is equal to what you see over here. So it's Q0 P2M plus Q2, then 2M decreased by 2, then Q4 with 2N decreased by 4, and finally Q2M with P0. Now P0, I remind you, is equal to 1 whereas Q0 is equal to 0. So let's begin the proof. Q2K is the probability of a return after K steps. If we multiply it by 2 to the power 2K, well, as you can see from the definition that we had made of the probability, that's equal to the number of paths totally above or totally below the x-axis. Now that is the number of paths that have not returned home. We have taken a total of 2m steps and so we must multiply by this number of steps. Again, the structure is very similar. The probability multiplied by 2m minus 2k. What is the value of k over here? Anything. It could be 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up till m, and so we must sum over all values of k starting from 0, ending at m, and this will give us the total number of paths with 2m steps that start at home and end at home. The other way of writing this is p2m, 2 to the power 2m. To write it a little more nicely, it's what we have just proved. Stare at this for a while and notice that this relation over here or this relation over here holds only if m is bigger than 1 or equal to 1. It does not hold for m equal to 0. You can see that it doesn't because for m equal to 0, this side over here is 1, whereas this side over here is equal to 0. q of 0 is 0. We're now going to use this theorem to derive a formula for the probability of first return. Here's the promised formula. The probability q of a first return after 2m steps and here, of course, as I said earlier, m has to be bigger than 1 or equal to it. Well, that formula is over here before you, that Q2m is this thing, which you will recognize as being P2m divided by 2m minus 1. And that, of course, is just this. We will use the theorem derived just a little bit earlier to prove this, and the proof that I'm going to give you is from this book by Grinstead and Snell. We start by defining generating functions p of x and q of x. So p of x is defined as the sum from m equals 0 to infinity of p to m x to the power m. Note here that m is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. Whereas P is 0, 2, 4, 6, etc. And we've done this because if we have P 2M plus 1 or minus 1, that's an odd number and that P would be equal to 0 as discussed earlier. We also define Q of X in this way and the sum goes from M equals 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. But remember that Q of 0 is equal to 0. What's the use of these generating functions? Well, if you are able to calculate them, then by taking derivatives of q, you will get q2m. The generating functions p and q contain more information than just the coefficients which are q2m or p2m. So with these definitions of the generating functions, 
Let's multiply them together. Q of x into P of x is this infinite series multiplied by this infinite series. And so that's Q times P. And then this is x to the k into x to the n, which then combines into k plus n. Now let's call this k plus n something else. We'll call it m. And so this over here becomes x to the power m. And obviously, in that case, n is equal to m minus k. And so p gets this index. Now I'm going to use the theorem that we just proved. We showed that for m bigger than or equal to 1, this relationship holds. So note that we have a summation over k. k occurs over here and k occurs over here, just like k occurs over here and k occurs over here. And so what we have is p of x. That is to say, this thing now is summed over m and is exactly what we have over here. However, we have done one thing which is wrong. Note that over here, the summation is over m going from 0 to infinity, whereas this theorem does not hold for m equal to 0. But, of course, that's easily fixed. All we need to do is to subtract 1 from this. So this is minus p0. And p0, as you remember, we define to be equal to 1. So I repeat that in calculating q into p, we took k and n going from 0 to infinity, or k and m going from 0 to infinity, but we must exclude m equal to 0. And so this summation, therefore, has to begin at m equal to 1, and, and we compensate that with this minus 1 over here. Well, if q into p is equal to p minus 1, then obviously q of x is equal to p of x minus 1 over p, or you could write this as 1 minus 1 over p of x. Let's now look at p of x in some detail. So p of x is, of course, by definition this, and p2m is 1 over 2 to the power 2m into this thing. So I've just written what p2m is. And now the question is, how do you sum this infinite series? The answer is actually astonishingly simple. It's just 1 over square root of 1 minus x. Please accept this for now. I'm going to show that this is true in just another few minutes. So, accepting this, q of x is 1 minus 1 over p of x, which is equal to this. We have obtained, therefore, q of x, from which we can get the probability that we want, that is q2m. But let's see what would be the best way to get q2m. Obviously, if we take the derivative of q, so the derivative of this is 1 over 2, 1 over square root of 1 minus x. That's half of p of x. And so let's write out p of x. p of x, as we had defined it, is just the summation over m. On the other hand, q of x was originally defined as the sum over n of q to n x to the power n, and its derivative is got by differentiating this, which gives us n q to n with x reduced by one power. And now to make a connection between this and this, obviously we need to define n minus 1 as equal to m in the summation. So then we get dq by dx is equal to this thing over here. So this tells us that this 
quantity over here, in other words, m plus 1 into q 2m plus 2, has to be equal to this quantity over here. And bringing this 2 into here, this becomes 2m plus 1. And now what we have is that q of 2m plus 2 is equal to this quantity over here. But what we need is m 1 less. And so I'm going to decrease m by 1 over here, 1 over here, 1 over here, 1 over here. And let's see what happens. In that case, q2m is equal to this quantity. And now, of course, the 2 that we had over here then makes this 2 to the power 2m minus 1. We're almost there, except that we need a little simplification for this, and we will get that by realizing that 2m choose m is, by definition, this 2m factorial over m factorial squared. Now, if you write this out, this is 2m into 2m minus 1 into 2m minus 2, etc. But that becomes 2m minus 2 factorial. And what we have over here is m into m minus 1, and similarly over here, so that becomes m squared into m minus 1 factorial, which then becomes 2m minus 2 choose m minus 1. Now this quantity is precisely what we had over here, and so finally what we've discovered is that this q2m becomes 1 over 2m minus 1, and then this factor over here, which of course you realize as being p2m. So we've discovered a very important result, that the probability of first return after 2m steps is equal to 1 over 2m minus 1 into the probability of return after 2m steps. Any return after 2m steps, whereas this is the probability of first return. So that's quite an achievement, but one step, one important step is missing. What was that step? Well, we had to show that 1 over square root of 1 minus x is equal to this. And as I said, it's not trivial. In Grinstead and Snell, this is given as a problem, and it said, use the binomial theorem to prove this. I wasn't able to do it, so I did it a different way. My strategy will be to show that both sides obey the same first order ordinary differential equation and they obey the initial condition as well. So let's look at this side, this 1 over square root of 1 minus x, I'm going to call that f of x. Now clearly if I put x equal to 0, then f of 0 is equal to 1. I can take the derivative of this, so df by dx is then equal to this quantity over here. I recognize that f of x is 1 over 1 minus x square root, and so this can be simplified into f of x over 2 into 1 minus x. I'm going to write that in a slightly different way as this first order differential equation with this being the initial condition. Second stage of the proof. Well, I'm going to call this thing over here f of x, so I'm going to call f of x equal to this. Now clearly, if I take x equal to 0, then there's only one term over here which will be non-zero, and that is when m is equal to 0, in which case I'll get 1 over 1, and then 0 choose 0, and so this over here will be equal to 1. Of course, this is an infinite series, and later on, we will have to confront this issue. For what values of x does this series converge? For now, let me just take the derivative, as I did before df by dx, which is obviously this. When I differentiate x to the m, I get m x to the m minus 1. 
And now I'm going to call m minus 1 as n. So instead of summing over m, I sum over n. And in that case, m becomes n plus 1. I then have a summation over this. Now I will use the definition of the binomial coefficient, which is 2n plus 2 factorial over n plus 1 factorial squared. I can write 2n plus 2 factorial as this into 2n factorial. And then n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 into n factorial. And since there's a square, of course, I must do that as well over here. So this makes 4n plus 2 over n plus 1. And then this familiar binomial coefficient that you see over here, 2n choose n. We therefore have df of x now equal to this. So this 4n plus 2 from here, 1 over 2 to the power 2n plus 2, which comes from here. And then this binomial coefficient, x to the power n. Let's separate this off into two parts. One part with 4n, which gives this over here. And then the part which comes from multiplying 2 with this stuff over here gives us this. But what we have over here is exactly what we have over here. In other words, we have x df by dx, and the other part, rewrite this slightly, and you get exactly the same differential equation as you had earlier. Further, the same initial condition as over here exists over here. Now the uniqueness theorem tells us that a first order differential equation has only one solution. And so therefore, this has to equal this. Now that was a mathematical point. Let's return to something that is more substantive. And this is the problem of eventual return. So will this guy always return home eventually. Eventually means after taking an unlimited number of steps. We can ask, what is the chance of his not ever returning? Will he get lost? Is there a chance that he will never come back? Now for this particular path, look over here, he's come back once, twice, thrice, four times, five times. And so certainly that's one possibility. The real question is, can he just keep walking and walking and never come back? How do we address that question? Let's go back to the formula that we just derived. The probability of first return after 2m steps is 1 over 2m minus 1 times this thing, which is p2m. And as discussed earlier, first return makes sense only when m is bigger than or equal to 1. If m is equal to 0, then q of 0 is by definition 0. Now what I will do is put m equal to 1, then 2, then 3, then 4. This is what I get after doing a computation. q2 is 0 0.5 half. Q4 is one-eighth. Q6, Q8, etc., etc. By the time this man has taken 20 steps, the probability of first return becomes this small. And you can see that as M becomes bigger and bigger, Q becomes smaller and smaller. That, of course, makes a lot of sense. As he takes more and more steps, the probability of his first return becomes smaller and smaller and goes to zero eventually. Now, let's ask what is the probability 
of returning within 2n steps? Well, then we have to calculate S2n, which means adding up Q0 plus Q2 plus Q4 all the way up till Q2n. Q0 is, of course, 0. So we need to do this summation, Q2 up till Q2n. And now, numerically, if one does that, well, S2 is equal to Q0 plus Q2, which is 0 0.5. S4 is Q0 plus Q2 plus Q4, and that's this. So just add this to this. Since these are all positive terms, you see that S keeps increasing. But where will this actually end? What is S infinity? S infinity is what we will call the probability of final return. This is the sum of all the Q's up till infinity. How much will this be? We need to calculate it. But the very first question that a mathematician asks is, does this series converge or not? The next question is, what number is the series converging to? Fortunately, in this case, we can calculate that. So, let's go back to our expression for P2M, which is this, and ask what happens when M becomes bigger and bigger. So, writing this out, this is equal to 2M factorial over this thing over here. Now I will use Stirling's approximation, which says that n factorial is uh, this thing over here, square root of 2 pi n, n to the power n, exponential of minus n. So now that we have two factorials over here, one over here and one over here, we're going to use Stirling's approximation, and that becomes square root of 2 pi into 2m, and then 2m to the power 2m, the exponential here and the exponentials below cancel exactly. And so this is what we have to simplify. That's easily done. m to the power 2m. Well, there's m to the m, and that's squared, so that cancels out. The 2 to the 2m cancels with this, and so we are left with just this thing. In other words, as m becomes larger and larger, p2m goes down with m as 1 over the square root of m. This also tells us immediately how fast q goes down as m increases. So q2m, as you recall earlier from our theorem, was 1 over 2m minus 1 into p2m, which means that this goes down as 1 over m to the power 3 over 2. So the m from here and the m to the half from here give us m to the power 3 halves. Now we are in a position to talk about convergence or divergence. We know from the theory of infinite series, which you must have read in calculus, is that when you sum a series whose terms as m becomes large go down but don't go down fast enough, then that result is divergent. We'll call it infinity. If instead of this half we had something that was a little bit bigger than 1, then this would have not been infinity, it would have been some finite sum. We conclude therefore that the series in m diverges, that this sum over here is in fact infinite. However, as I just remarked, this half over here, if it had been something bigger than 1, even a little bit bigger than 1, then we would have something finite, like over here. m to the 3 halves is certainly bigger than 1, and so this series converges, and now the task before us is to find out what value it converges to. I'm going to do this in two different ways. The first way is to note that S infinity is this series, 
which is of course the same as the moment generating function evaluated at x equals 1. We've just shown that this exists and now we will see how to find the value. As you recall, we were successful in actually calculating q of x and now put x equal to 1 over here. So this becomes 0 and so we arrive at our very important result that this series converges and it converges to the value 1. In other words, the probability that the man will eventually return home is equal to 1. It is certain that he will return home. There's also a second way of getting this result. So look at q of x, which we found was p minus 1 over p, which can be written as 1 over 1 minus p. But we just discovered that this p over here is divergent. So since p at x equal to 1 is infinity, we get 1 minus 1 over infinity. And once again, we verify using a slightly different kind of argument that s at infinity has to be 1. The man will certainly return home. Let's move to the random walk in two dimensions. So we can have a particle or a person or a whatever move first this way and then there's the option of left or right or continuing or going backward. Let's analyze this in some detail. So suppose there's a chance one-fourth of moving towards the right, one-fourth towards the left, one-fourth up, one-fourth down. Of course, we could change all of these subject to the condition that they all add up to one, but this is the simplest and as it is, there's plenty of complexity here too. Imagine that you start at some point over here. Well, this is a typical path that could be followed. As before, we are interested in walks that return to the original positions. Suppose there's a return after 2m steps. Well, that means the same number of steps have to be taken to the right. Then in the vertical direction, m minus k would be up and m minus k would be down. What is the probability of that? Well, you simply multiply all the probabilities together. And so, k steps to the right, the probability is one-fourth into one-fourth into one-fourth k times. Same for the number of steps to the left. These m minus k steps are up, and these m minus k steps are down. Next, we multiply by the number of possibilities as before, we have 2m steps and therefore 2m factorial possibilities, but then all k steps to the right are identical, same for the left, and then similarly up and down. Of course, the number of steps to the left is not fixed. It could be anywhere from 0 up till m, and so we need to sum over all possibilities and this, of course, is what we call P2M in two dimensions. In one dimension, there was no summation. There was only a fixed number of steps to the right. Of course, you can ask what will happen in three dimensions. In that case, you would have 2M factorial, and then instead of four factors below, you would have six factors below, and you would have two summations, but that's for later. Well, now let's simplify. So, all of these get compressed into 1 over 4 to the 2m. 2m factorial comes out over here. I've divided by m factorial squared and put m factorial back over here. So, this cancels that and now I've done that because this over here will be m choose k and this will be m 
choose m minus k, and so we have this summation over here. But how to do this summation? This will need a fairly clever trick. Let's note that we can expand 1 plus x to the power n using the binomial theorem, and so if we sum over all values of k from 0 to n, that's n choose k into x to the k, and what we can do then is multiply this by itself, so 1 plus x to the n into 1 plus x to the n is a product of two binomial series, one summing over k, the other summing over l, and so we have x to the power k, x to the power l, and that's x to the k plus l. We will put k plus l equal to s, and now we will then expand 1 plus x to the power 2n, which is this. Instead of using l, I will use s, and so s, which is k plus l, goes from 0 up till 2n, and of course the sum over k persists, that's 0 to n, and then this becomes this, this becomes that, and this becomes x to the power s. But wait, can't I apply the binomial theorem directly upon 1 plus x to the power 2n? Of course I can. That is simply this quantity over here. 1 plus x to the 2n is equal to this. Now all we need to do is compare the coefficient here with the coefficient here. And what do we get? We get that this 2n choose s is then the sum over k, this sum over k, n k, n s minus k. So now just call n m and s, which can be any number between 0 and 2n. Well, let's choose that to be m. So we have m over here, k, and then instead of s, we have m minus k. But here, you notice that this thing and this thing are exactly the same. This is m over k factorial into m minus k factorial, and this is exactly that as well. And so what we have is the square, mk squared. We've therefore succeeded in summing this series and found that p2m is equal to this, which is, of course, as we've just established, equal to this thing squared. Now our real interest is in summing the series. What is the series m equals 0 to infinity of p to m? For this, we've got to look at the behavior of these individual terms in the limit that m becomes very, very large. We found earlier, using Stirling's approximation, that this quantity over here behaves as 1 over square root of m. So, since we have the square of that over here, the terms for large m then behave like 1 over square root of m squared, that is to say, as 1 over m. You can use any number of tests, but the integral test will tell you that this diverges as a logarithm, and so the answer for this is infinity. Now, in exactly the same way as we did for the one-dimensional case, we can prove that q of x defined suitably is equal to p of x minus 1 over p of x. There's no difference in terms of the theorems that need to be established for one and two dimensions. But now again we find that p at x equal to 1 is equal to infinity, which means that again q of 1 will be 1, and that means that the drunk in two dimensions will return home. There's no difference in this regard between the one-dimensional case and the two-dimensional case. But the amazing thing is that the three-dimensional case is different. Why is that different? Because instead of square root of m squared, as you have over here, you will have 
square root of m cubed. So 1 over m to the power 3 halves. Now this series actually converges. Now when I say it converges, we don't know the value to which it converges, but of course people have found that out. The point is that this is not infinity, it's a finite number, and so there's a finite chance of not returning home. Well, the moral of that is, a drunken man will always return, but a drunken bird in three dimensions, he can fly, may never return.